ันวอลค์ค่ะทุกคนกลับมาที่ที่ซีเกิลทอล์กส์ที่มาร์คนีซีเกิลเปเดอร์สันที่ Graduate Center คิวนีในมิดทาวน์มิดทาวน์แมนฮัตตันและนี่เป็นวันสุดที่ดีที่สุดในนิวยอร์กซิตี้สไลท์ลี่คูลและเราเป็นการที่ได้ฮอลลีย์เดย์ที่ก็ได้รับการแสดงในทั่วโลกเป็นวันอาทิตย์ที่ดีที่สุดในอันดับหนึ่งเป็นเรื่องของการแสดงของพระเจ้าและและ And we are thinking about today also about theater, as always in our talks. And with us, we have the great uh, Thomas Oberender, um, who started out as a playwright uh, and became a very significant and important uh, thinker and curator in the European scene, especially, of course, in Germany. But he was a director of the Wiener Festival, the Berliner Festspiele, where he had the Gropius Bau uh, under his uh, wings, as well as the great immersion series he created. And he did something what we followed uh, very much and thought it was a Great contribution, actually, to global theater. It was um, his project. It was called Down to Earth, and we will uh, talk about it. Inspired by Bruno Latour and this uh, publication here by Spectre Books and Leipzig uh, talks about it. I encourage everyone to look at it. And um, so, welcome, Thomas. Where are you now, and what time is it? I'm in Berlin, and it's uh, half past seven, a sunny day, and um, yeah. Most of the people are on the countryside right now, but I think they come back in the evening, and uh, I hope some join us in this conversation. So they spend some time in nature, you think? I think so. Yes. Uh, yesterday we visited friends uh, on a lake uh, nearby Berlin, and uh, yes, uh, there are so many people in nature right now. I think it's what we call spring. Yeah. Um, yeah. And what we enjoy, of course. Yeah, and uh, and I think it is so close to a, a subject. You know, we're thinking about it. You're also writing a book. We come to it later. As is the subline of this uh, book. You know, there are ideas. You know, for a culture of sustainability. And you ask in your book. You know, how does art connect to uh, ecology and uh, what changes uh, are there in life for us, but also for our cultural institutions, for the theaters. And the idea of the Gaia, the, the the Earth goddess, a Greek term, we will talk about it. You know how how can she be represented? Bruno Latour in his work, it, it is so central um, about it. Frederic uh, Aitui will talk without it on next Friday. And how can we do art without uh, 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 abusing resources? What is important? Um, how can we uh, uh, present work now? What is significant? What is urgent? What shall we do? So. Um, Thank you really for um, for joining us, Thomas. Um, we also gave this work, you know, one of the awards. I think last year we said it's one of the ten great global projects. To all our listeners who do not know, and maybe also I, I will learn something new. Down to Earth, what was it all about? The Down to Earth project was um, a mixture of exhibition, community project, and um, festival for five or four or five weeks. Uh, and um, it was a bit special because it was, I think, first time that uh, sustainability and climate change was not only the issue, it was uh, the way how the format was uh, developed and uh, presented. It means we had some simple rules. We didn't use any kind of uh, airplane transport. Uh, not for the artworks, not for the artists. Uh, we made all uh, all the energy uh, we used transparent, all the materials, and um, we um, yes, we so we didn't use beamers, we didn't use microphones, we didn't use uh, spots. It was daylight. It was uh, everything uh, in the same time, all in once. Uh, it means you could visit uh, exhibition at the same time you could see performances and the same time you could uh, join to conversations or to workshops. So it was a different kind of space uh, that was um, in a way unique because it was all about climate change, our relation between culture and nature, civilization, wilderness, uh, technology. But um, we didn't use uh, technology. We 
try to avoid uh, any kind of uh, resources we could, could avoid. So also in the internet, there was no streaming. There was only black and white um, uh, design of our website. Um, and we, we offered some downloads, but uh, we did not use uh, uh, oil paint for the publications. We used old posters to make books out of it. And so we tried to find ways to avoid uh, in our own process, uh, what is the subject of the project itself. So, and it was great fun. And uh, we invited a lot of communities, activists, scientists, uh, artists who joined and uh, usually would never meet each other. So I think public spaces are usually a kind of bubble for a certain community. And what we achieved is to bring very different communities together and uh, learn from each other and uh, yeah it was a very open and very inspiring place and uh, I think it was also sustainable in a way because um, we built something we did have a repair cafe we we, we built tiny houses uh, and uh, we built connections between all these uh, initiatives and um, and we learned a lot about ourselves about our institution how it usually works. I didn't know where our um, air conditioning system was situated in the building. I didn't know so many things. And so we learned uh, all the specialists with their specific qualities and experience. Um, it was a kind also of discovering dem democracy in your own structure uh, so that we are all on one level if we have this uh, kind of um, we're dealing with the same problem, but we have different kind of qualifications. And it was a way to discover the qualifications of other people and to bring them in also if they are all the time around you, but you never you never ask them for help usually. Uh, but in this uh, project we did, and uh, it was very, it was good for, for, for the whole collective of people who work in the building and with the project. Mm -hmm. How many artists participated? And can you tell us about two, three projects so we have an idea of what people did? Um, <clears throat> I think all together it was around 200 artists. Um, uh, we had a regular um, exhibition of 2,000 square meters with works by Andreas Gruski and uh, so many well-known artists. Um, Julia Strauss <clears throat> was also in uh, in the Siegel talks before, I think. Uh, so <clears throat> we did have um, installations, uh, sculptures. Uh, we invited in the same time musicians, or we invited in the same time theater works. Um, for example, from um, French or Belgium artist Francois Chaineau. Uh, and usually he would uh, perform the music with his laptop, so as a pre-produced sound file. And we paid him extra to bring uh, musicians in the situation to make live music. Uh, we didn't use um, spots. We made colored curtains in front of the windows to, to give different light. So it was... Uh, in a way, a very analog experience. And uh, so this was one of the aims to change the, uh, the way how the audience is welcomed in a space like that. Uh, it's not the typical, uh, you buy a ticket and then you know what you get. It was a bit uh, surprising for all of them. And in the same time, some people came 35 times again, because it was always different. They, they, they discovered that it's all the time different what they can um, experience uh, in this project. And so it was uh, not, not this kind of offering a product that is ready and uh, you can put it in a box and bring it to the next exhibition hall and so on. It was very specific for a time, also for a daytime. In the evenings, there was no light in the exhibition, so people use the flashlight of the uh, mobile phone <laughs> to see the pictures, the artworks. And so, but this is also an experience of uh, what nature means. It becomes dark. And um, um, it's, uh, some people uh, really understand what we, or for example, we worked with uh, uh, Thomas Saraceno and he discovered a spider in the building. And so he protected the spider, the, 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 the web as an artwork. 
And uh, so the spider could survive in this environment, uh, let's say some month. And uh, we learned that, that there are all the time animals, uh, all the time other life forms in our environment. And it's the same time their environment. But usually we kick them out, we clean it out. Uh, and uh, so I think on many levels, uh, we learned uh, that also art making is a kind of violent process against other life forms and uh, presences in our uh, venues that we don't accept. For example, in, in theater, uh, you would never accept uh, any kind of insect or uh, any kind of tiny animal that is also living in this uh, in this building in this uh, environment uh, because it's our environment it's our place of work and it seems to be quite normal but it's not it's our rule it's mm -hmm. what we do with nature with uh, yes with everything that surrounds us yeah, for our listeners, <clears throat> the, the Kropius Bau um, is as central in Berlin as perhaps the Whitney or um, a MoMA in New York City. Um, I wonder what MoMA or the Whitney would say if you say, let's take off air conditioning, let's take out electricity. Um, you reacted to, if I understood right, what the great uh, French philosopher who, who left us, Bruno Latour, said, how can you make an exhibition or an artwork about climate change? But you have the uh, uh, the climate control working, even when nobody is in there, you know, to keep a, a certain temperature and um, humidity. How did your system, your administration, how, how did they react? How did you make that happen? Uh, I think uh, all the people have been very enthusiastic, basically. So uh, nobody has to be convinced that we should do something like that because um, the idea, everybody loves the idea and to do something different. And there is a certain point of politics, and that becomes also sensitive for questions of law, of justice. Um, that means um, we have a tradition of making contracts and uh, insurance systems. So this is not, uh, you, you, you can't overcome this with good ideas and good intentions, because uh, if you uh, switch off the climate, the, the, the um, climate system or the, the air conditioning system, then uh, you lose your statistic. And this is uh, usually uh, necessary to, to lend artworks from other institutions or from collectors. So it was very interesting that on this point, of course, it's it becomes uh, very political, all this, uh, let's say, artwork, because you go into the operation system of all of our institutions that are based on these laws. So we never expect, we did not expect this. And we, we, uh, it was for us, for my colleagues, uh, a wonderful team who, who did this work. Uh, they achieved to make contracts from all the institutions. They, they accepted that we don't use um, the air conditioning system because it's not necessary for this kind of artworks. Uh, so, for example, also we, we rejected uh, transport offers by doing studio prints. So we don't uh, ask a big transportation company to bring the artworks. We printed them in the city itself uh, and put them on the wall. And this was all easy in a way, but uh, on a certain point, you touch this um, glass ceiling of, let's say, uh, contract, uh, contract uh, um, politics, uh, and this is uh, this is uh, this is a big uh, question for the whole system in the next years. How we can avoid what you are talking about that mm -hmm. all this. Uh, institutions are air conditioned 365 days a year and around the clock. Also, if no visitor is there, if no exhibition is there, this is something we have to change, of course. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> um, Thomas, um, you started out as a playwright. Uh, as I know, you're a great fan of uh, Peter Handke, uh, Boucher Strauss. Uh, you were close you know, to the Berlin Volksbühne, the work of Castor. Um, 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 but Kennedy work, what we see now of, of the great Norwegians of Vigavingaringa. 
in, in the Muller and um, all of it. Um, a lot of work in theater is now looking, how do we rewrite the third act? How are we formally innovative, you know, in the writing or in the presenting? Are there new acting methods? Um, you're working also on a new book. Um, and if I understand right, you say we have to radically rethink what we present. Maybe talk a little bit about that. I'm really curious and interested in that. Um, <clears throat> So the basic idea is, I would say, very simple. Um, I think there is a connection to, let's say, this kind of theater form of a black box uh, that was invented in the Renaissance. So um, it's still this kind of instrument we use every day if we make in the Western world theater. Um, but uh, we forget that this was uh, something uh, that some people in uh, South Italy uh, or North Italy invented in a certain period um, uh, in history. And before there was different theater forms, of course. And I think there is a, uh, a connex or connection between, let's say, the Anthropocene as a kind of, um, yeah, an age of our planet a certain period in, in, in time of our planet that is uh, now formed by us as a species, um, like, a, you know, like a force of nature, our species uh, transformed um, the, the planet itself, the, the, the earth, the layers of earth. We can read the layers of earth as a uh, let's say open book of our history of species this is new this is something that never happened before that's why it's called the anthropocene and in the same time i think uh, in the beginning of the anthropocene let's say if we go a little bit back uh, there was this period in which um in europe uh, a certain kind of new culture was developed and this culture was basically something that put the humans in the position of the gods of god uh, before so um if you think about theater um the ancient theater of the greek people was a theater that was uh of course done by humans but it was um let's say an encounter not only between humans, it was also an encounter between humans and gods. So it was, in a way, um, with Newt Orton said, it, it was the old Greek didn't have a religion. Their religion was theater. The theater was the everyday practice of religion in the ancient Athenian um, period. So uh, it was not the human who was in the center of it all. There are so many gods, so many influences, so many forces, powers that are non-human. And so in the same way, theater was formed in the medieval period. But in Renaissance, suddenly uh, humans started to put the perspective of, of gods beside and develop their very own perspective. It's the central perspective in painting. It was preformed in, in architecture and in the art of creating gardens. And then they, uh, they took this uh, principle into the way how people like Dürer or Brunelleschi uh, created a new way of presenting an image of the world. And this image of the world was a very specific technique. And with the same technique, on a certain point, they started to build something that never uh, was made before. They, they built houses without windows. Um, the Ata Olimpico in Vicenza was one of the very earliest um, uh, prototypes of this theater. So, Theater was in the times before mostly outside. Suddenly they 
they brought the theater inside and let the city and the nature and everything outside. And they organize the way how you see what's going on on stage in the way how they organize paintings in this time with this uh, principle of uh, um, central perspective. And it's very interesting because in this time, uh, in the very first time, it was the so-called uh, eye point, the point from where the perspective starts. In the medieval time, this perspective on this point was God. And for God, the things had completely different proportions. Uh, so if you see medieval paintings, you see small houses, big humans, animals. So it's not this kind of how they organize the world. But in this time, humans started to create, not only in painting, also in, uh, in the theater, a way of artificial uh, world that looks like a world itself. And so they started to make it more rational. They make it more eloquent. So suddenly it was like a labor, like a studio, uh, the theater. And this was a, I think amazing invention. People, I think they, it's like if we use virtual reality glasses, it, I think it's the same effect. When they entered this very early forms of theater, they saw something they never saw before. It was really humans that are moved in pictures and pictures and everything is organized to, to, to create this kind of image of world that is the world in a way. Uh, the very early, um, the very first play they performed was um, uh, King, King Oedipus by Sophocles. So they built this kind of artificial world to go back in time into Sophocles' world, but at the same time, it looks like uh, the set design looked like uh, Vincenza. It was their own city in a way. So the architecture that was painted on, 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 the, on, the, uh, on, on the set um, and from this, uh, we, we, we learn, uh, not only by theater, of course, um, that <clears throat> we have a new position in the world. And this position is that we are in the center. We are uh, uh, the decisive uh, um, uh, position and everything is related to us. And in this time, suddenly, over period of time, um, it happened that we started to exclude any different kind of life form from this stage. So theater from this time on meant humans talk to humans and whatever is represented from the from the planet from the from the world is only present on stage if it's possible to represent it in people in the relation of people how they speak about it how they behave. So the Anthropocene uh, is uh, in this inner way a scene for the Anthropos. And this became quite uh, normal. So um, from, from this point on, we developed a certain kind of playwriting with a specific dramaturgy, with a specific logic, and it's still the logic of 90% of our movies and uh, novels and so on. So it's, uh, um, it's a development that is very fundamental. And in a way, many people think, okay, if you ask, how would you imagine a theater? They would start to, uh, to make a drawing of a proscenium and a curtain. And so this is our image of theater. In the same time, of course, theater as a word meant so much more all the time. Um, so it was basically theater is everything that is opening a space to uh, inhabit a different kind of uh, things. It, it's not necessarily humans. Uh, so you have the memory theater as a great tradition of uh, since the ancient time. Uh, so you, you put m uh, memories into a set or uh, the early uh, planetariums are called uh, Sternen theaters, uh, star theaters. 
because they present stars or in the anatomy in the university, you have the anatomy theater or you have a, a war theater in, in, in the history of uh, the military um, uh, plannings of actions. So they before they go into the battle, they, they play the battle on a certain uh, on a certain place and it's called the, the, the Kriegstheater, it's the, the, the place where the battle happens. So theater in the same time is a kind of metaphor. And I think uh, we have learned that this, let's say, development from um, inventing this kind of instrument, this kind of apparatus uh, theater from Renaissance in Europe is deeply connected to uh, the development that leads to the Anthropocene, to this period in the in the history of our planet that is so fundamentally influenced by our species. And this becomes more and more problematic. So I started yeah. to think uh, from this point on, if we want to change in this climate crisis situation uh, a little bit, um, the way how we talk about the problem, we should go back into the deep structure of this um, theater construction that is so, uh, ecocentric, so anthropocentric, and we have to overcome this to make a step <clears throat> forward in our way how we deal with the climate crisis and uh, climate uh, change. Basically, this was the intention, and so then I started to uh, to think about, uh, as many people, by the way, do, and also you have one uh, great colleague, uh, Una. Uh, Khanduri, uh, it's it's one of your professors in, in your university. She's NYU, one of you, yeah, in New York City, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, in New York City, and she and she was one of in the in the in the 90s, uh, last century. She started to write beautiful books about relation of animals uh, and uh, stage, and uh, to 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 say that this kind of what would we think it's normal, it's not normal. And uh, I think we have to, um, I think we have to uh, learn from from people like uh, Chanduri and and other theorists, but also from the art world itself that started to go out of the black box and to re-asking the rules and uh, the the situations and structures of black box theaters. And this means, in the end, everything. So it means uh, it's a problem of representation. It's a problem of dramaturgy, of logic, of uh, uh, incorporating what, uh, who, who is leading the action, what is, um, what, what are the rules and uh, new ways of uh, storytelling, or is there any story anymore? So, so this was the the, the starting point of my um, research. No, it's um, it, it is such a significant and important contribution, and in a way, perhaps also the time of Corona is part of it. Um, we all have to think if we have to not really stop and completely rethink what we do. Is it still enough to have the beautiful black boxes? You know, the uh, the Italian teatro italiano idea, and um, don't we have to include what Latour and others call the critical zone, the plants, the animals? Um, how do we uh, connect uh, to what is so urgent, so necessary, and present it on that highly symbolic space of theater and performance, where we say we can no longer just represent interhuman conflicts. We have to think about nature. We have to take it into account. This is not an academic question. It's not an artistic question. It is a fundamental question as in the Games of Thrones, they would say the winter is coming. You know, so something is happening. It's in front of us for our children and grandchildren. Um, what responsibility does the theater um, uh, have? And I think um, um, your work, uh, uh, The Down to Earth, and, uh, and and your upcoming book, I think, and we'll discuss it, has answers. And it's uh, perhaps uncomfortable for us in theater, for institutions. People are trained in the way of, you know, the playwrights. So, um, what are models? What do you think um, should be done? Should we do Greek plays outside? Or um, what What are potential forms you see that uh, will work? 
Yeah, I, I, I really don't avoid to, to give answers, uh, but I can give some examples. And I think um, uh, we, can, we can split it in, in three parts. One is, um, um, let's say, what is the issue or the subject of theater? So since a long time, I would say in the meantime, playwrights or theater makers are interested in bringing in the topic of climate change, of interspecies relations on stage in, let's say, in form of new plays, in uh, form of uh, performances, or however. Second thing is, and this is completely different from that, I would say, uh, is um, if it's not only the content, if it's the form and the way how we practice it itself that becomes different, this is the more radical level of, uh, let's say, the deeper way of questioning uh, the, the rules of, of the theater game. So you have to develop a different understanding of what theater is. And it is not the black box thing. It's something else. It's, uh, it has to do with uh, the way how our mindset is uh, constructed and how it de uh, dives into a model of world. And this kind of uh, encounter is, in my experience, the, the most interesting aspect of theater. And the third thing is, of course, uh, the question of how can we make uh, theater in any way, how, uh, the, however it's produced, more sustainable? How can we avoid to waste energy? So uh, also to go online is not uh, sustainable. It's uh, um, <clears throat> it's a way to to have a democratic approach to many 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 uh, communities and individuals. But in itself, it's using a lot of energy. And uh, so uh, the third part is maybe something, there are so many uh, experts on it. I think for me, the second question is, uh, or the second part of, of this problem is the most interesting because theater usually it's done by humans. So there is an anthropogenic uh, level in it and it's hard to avoid it. Second thing is usually uh, our tradition of theater is very uh, exclusive. So it excludes a lot of different um, uh, life forms and entities who are doing the same game as we do. They also are world builders. So every animal is creating a world around itself. Uh, every microbacteria is something that is world building something. Um, and the question is, um, if Gaia is not this godness as a kind of character, as a person, if Gaia is this kind of superstructure that uh, connects all the entities who build their own worlds and these worlds are interconnected and in a constant exchange and uh, let's say everything is related to everything, if this is the Gaia principle as a kind of superstructure of life, how life gives life to life in the future. Um, it's not the work of one species. It's something that is uh, done by this, what uh, James Lovelock called the Gaia principle, the, the principle of uh, this kind of superorganism that is this, uh, this, this uh, Yes, this connection of all the singular um, um, agents of, of life. So if we go into that, then um, of course it's it becomes very interesting. How can you make an animal, uh, how can you create a structure in which the animal or the plant, a tree, uh, a mouse or a spider, how can you invite them or how can we invite us to their reality and create something in which we don't overrule all these other entities? 
And uh, I think there are some very good examples and some very interesting approaches. And there are some very old uh, theories about it. So uh, if you think about Atto, uh, for Atto, theater was not this. Um, he speaks about, by the way, also very, uh, uh, very interesting. He's, he's speaking about virtual reality. He, so he used this word in the 30s. Uh, in his, uh, in his uh, talk about theater or in, uh, in his book about theater. And um, the, the virtuality of theater in his mind was not the representation in the medium of the theater. It was a completely inhuman sphere of existence. And theater is the tool for our tool in which we can make a connection to this sphere that is not uh, human, so it's like Eastern. The day today is for all the Christian people. The day in which they remember that something happened that no human can do, only a force or a power uh, that is bigger than us, different from us, could do what happened on Eastern. And in a way, for um, Ato, this whole. Balinesian uh, theater world has nothing to do with our business of re representation. It was a closed world of forms, very intense uh, regarding uh, the body, the voice, the movement, the masses, the, all these things created the presence of something that is not human. And this was a deeper sense of, of this kind of theater. It was not reproducing our world so it uses uh, yeah. aspects of our world to 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 have a connection to to something something different and artists like uh, philip pareno so it's if we speak about theater we have to have a more brighter uh, perspective and uh, field of observation if we if, if you Think about the artworks of um, Philippe Areno or um, let's say Pierre Hugues or all these artists who created installation in which they included life forms without changing these life forms. So uh, they they containing it and they reacting on it. And uh, uh, let's say the grass, the trees, the bees, whatever is happening there becomes a part of the presence of this kind of uh, um, artificial uh, space they create or um, but the question is who is the decision maker usually it's the human mind who creates this kind of narration of, and logic that develops everything and in this field artists start to work with uh, techniques who are more sto stochastic it's not random it's something they they can in a way, handle, integrate into this uh, uh, structure of how different parts of the artwork are connected to each other and create a kind of super organism. But inside of this organism, nobody knows what will happen next. This is, uh, in a way, the, the way how it how it works. Also, some works of Rimini Protocol are organized like this as an encounter between a non, um, a, let's say, a wild life form like an octopus and his encounter with uh, a dancer. And it needs a lot of time. It's a completely different understanding of relation. It's not that we train the animals anything, uh, but we are open uh, for making relations and contact forms uh, um, between humans and non-humans that are usually not... Um, could be translated into scripts like a regular old-fashioned wonderful theater play. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, yeah, I I do agree with you. We are um, on uh, on the steps of a new world, um, a radical radical change. Uh, perhaps you know, and often Galileo, Brace Galileo, comes up um, when he used to. Um, um, the telescope, and so there were other planets, um, and there are many, many more. And um, and then we discovered, as you also mentioned, the great uh, book, the Down to Earth book. You know, we, perhaps the, the Earth is something very special of the millions and billions of stars, 
And but we understand, as you said, Lovelock said, we are perhaps a gigantic organism. We all are connected, animals, trees, an old animistic idea in indigenous societies um, thought for thousands, ten thousands of years. For our listeners, the theater of the Anthropocene, if I understand it right, and you correct me if I'm not, is the idea to say humans have done something to this planet that has radically changed it. Something, it didn't happen in the Holocene 10, 12,000 years ago when you started agriculture. It didn't radically change. When it happened isn't clear. Is it the Hiroshima bomb? Uh, is it the beginning of the Industrial uh, Revolution? Leibniz's uh, uh, um, uh, invention of the fertilizer? Who knows? Something happened, and it's as radical as a change as were the discoveries, you know, of a Galileo who said, we have to look differently at the world. Actually, the sun does not turn around us. We turn around the sun, as Darwin said, actually we come from monkeys. We are not created by God in seven days. And as Jung and Freud said, you know, 99% of what we think is governed by our subconscious. Um, was radically fought at the time by uh, the, the science. And now we are in a place where in significant scientists, writers, and thinkers as we are, again, called to rethink our world and we have to um, act on it. And the question is, what can theater do? What does theater do to represent that new world? And if the Hamlet's idea was... Um, the great idea of theater, it's a mirror, like what Shakespeare said, you know, theater is a mirror. But if we now see the world differently with the view from the outside, from space, that significant, most significant image of the 20th century, the Earth from the Apollo. So um, um, we have to see how can theater then also really represent that where we understand what Bruno Latour and so many others, and you say, humans are no longer godlike we are not the central character. We are not the central casting. We are part of an organism of plants, of viruses, of oxygen, of, of clouds, water. And um, we have to represent it on our stages in this highly symbolic and fought over space. What do we show? What will New York Theater Workshop show or on Broadway or in the University Theater? So to explain and connect us to the world, to explain the past, to be present in the moment, but also anticipate a future and to change it and to be called to action. So I think um, this idea is truly significant. It's changing us as it will change the work of the Siegel Center. We will try to do instead of a prelude festival inside our spaces, perhaps a park festival, and maybe we name it Down to Earth, inspired by you, your work, and by uh, Latour. And um, my question to you, in your research for your book, which might come out this year or next year, and uh, it, you mentioned earlier, it, said it is the book that has the most uh, uh, um, uh, reserved uh, on the, of the Theater That Side book list. It's not out yet, but people are interested. What, what did you discover? What are you discovering? What surprised you in your research? Um, first of all, I developed a completely new perspective on, let's say, what we call circus. So there is a new interest in circus. Uh, I would say it's a theater form, uh, but uh, what re represents an acrobat? It's a very interesting question. What represents an acrobat? Um, an acrobat, I don't know, he's representing the human being in relation to objects and animals basically and to its own body uh, so i think the non-human term in theater means that we uh, develop a new openness to the relation of uh, humans and objects and it could be also objects only I saw a wonderful theater work, Phantasmagoria, by Philip Ken, who used only objects, only pianos, to create a huge kind of theater form um, that is, in a way, old-fashioned as a scripted kind of performance. But at the same time, uh, what does it represent? It represents that everything is alive. All these objects, one, uh, have not been that objects. Um, 
they they are alive they have a spirit so i think uh, beside of that my relation to or my recognition of um, let's say shadow theater in this kind of uh, tradition of theater you can represent everything by uh, it could be an animal it could be a ghost it could be humans it could be mountains whatever could be brought into theater as a kind of let's say shadow of reality that is in itself a kind of symbol or something like that i also start to be really interested in all this um algorithmic artificial intelligence realities that are also driven by something that is not human anymore so um, uh, and um, the idea of uh, James Lovelock was uh, we are we are not longer living in the uh, period of Anthropocene. We are living in the period of Novocene. Novocene means it's a life form after the biologic life form of humans. That is a technological life form. And we are, let's say, on this very thin line. In uh, some years, I'm convinced uh, we will really observe something that seems to be intelligent because this kind of technology is able to um, uh, to produce reproduce itself in a way. We know the the artificial intelligence is a script, is software, but now we experience that software is writing software. Yeah. So for Lovelock, for Lovelock, it was at the beginning of the Novocene was when machines build machines that humans can't build anymore. Mm -hmm. So in a way, he say it started a new age in the moment when we crossed this border. And so we should have a very close look on all this, what we call um, artificial life forms, because also this old opposition between nature and technology and life, uh, biological life form, it's, it, it's melting. It's, uh, we are creating life forms. As humans, we create different life forms. And um, this will be radically uh, more intensified in the next uh, years. So it's uh, it's not about going back in nature, going into the mountain, going with theater in the forest. It's wonderful, but uh, in this kind of future, there um, we go into the scripts, the DNA of other life forms. Right now, we rewriting them, we change their their DNA. We as humans do that in the same time, like a virus is changing our DNA and make mutations in our organisms and so on. So I think this kind of oppositions are not longer um, the dialectic structure of Bertolt Brecht's theater, that you have oppositions. Now we're living in a symbiotic, uh, immersive situation and I think the theater forms will become immersive, but not in the sense that we all wear these virtual reality glasses. It, it means that we are in a kind of ecosystem of theater, of, of performance. And in this ecosystem, performative ecosystem, Maximilian Haas is a great theorist in Germany, very, very interesting artist and, and uh, scientist. He, he uh, uses this phrase of performative ecosphere. And in this uh, ecosphere of performance, there are so many different um, actors included. And we will find structures, how we play with algorithmic machines, with characters who are not humans, or also maybe not animals. And I think it, this is something we can learn if we have a closer look to theater, uh, to, to, to circus, to old forms of theater, and uh, this will be, I think, a slow process of um, reframing the black box, going out of it, uh, changing the rules inside of it, um, taking away the fourth, uh, the fourth wall. Um, I think this, uh, this is something that is still going on. It's not that it will come, it happened since 
uh, decades, I think, since Robert Wilson uh, did his great uh, Persepone show in the 70s in uh, Iran. And I think um, uh, this is something, if we uh, speak about Gaia theater, it's not about uh, humans and animals on stage. It's about um, different understanding what is in stage and what is uh, what is a kind of um, dramaturgy that is not scripted in the old way between this kind of um, actor um, actor beings. Yeah, absolutely. And I think this is the key question: that kind of new dramaturgy that is so radically different than thinking how to. We write a play, how to communicate the thoughts of the author or director to the audiences, the idea of what happens, you know, but you said when uh, machines, now program machines, uh, artificial intelligence created by programmers is so brilliant, you can now tell the program to program, you do not need programmers anymore, an entire species of uh, work, workers will, will disappear like uh, the digital, uh, like the book printers, you know, who had to enter in the old days into the electronic machines, you know, and type up a manuscript and uh, then it was printed. And um, and what what will that mean? Already now, I think in motion picture industries where bodies um, are, are filmed and then transferred into uh, animated films, machines talk to each other and humans don't understand how they do it. They just see a result. And the question is, what does it mean for us? And the idea of what you talked about uh, is mankind, then um, a step in the evolution, something that is no longer the godlike uh, self-definition of us, um, is a big question. Uh, Thomas, what do you think? Um, theater audiences have 300, 100, sometimes they have a thousand people looking at it. Um, how can theater communicate? How can performance intervene? What can theater do to raise an awareness um, of the planet, of this uh, Gaia principle? Gaia, the Greek, it's a Greek term, right? It's kind of, it's not just Mother Earth, but it's kind of the living form, life that gives life. We only are alive because someone was alive before us. It was plants. Uh, I think in the Botanical Garden in Berlin, there is the inscription by Linné. It says, be respectful of the plant. Everything lives because of the plant. You know, so um, how can Cedar react to a TV series that has 30 million viewers and with reruns of the TV series, friends, half a billion, a billion, what is the role? How should we, how should we uh, approach that? Um, <clears throat> I would. I, I'm not an oracle. Um, mm. uh, I think uh, every old way of theater that works is good. So there is nothing bad with that. Uh, I like it if people are touched by a very old story by Moliere or whatever. So uh, it's a kind of immersion if we, if, uh, if we go into the characters on stage and we feel with them and they make us cry and laugh. And that, that, that's, that's, it's a great uh, technology of doing something like that. And at the same time, we, we see there is um, something beside on other fields of performance. It could be in a exhibition hall, it could be uh, in a very kind of experimental festival environment. It, uh, for me, it starts with, uh, we, we have this very high cultural perspective on things like, uh, uh, let's say circus, everything that is uh, not based in text, huh? but, uh, we learn right now that they don't have this kind of opposition between uh, the artwork and the audience. They are surrounded by the audience. They have no uh, central perspective. So I think we will slowly learn the great adv uh, advantage of this kind of uh, sometimes very old art forms. Um, like we in, uh, discover now the wisdom of uh, indigenous uh, cosmologies, we, we, we rediscover other forms of expression of uh, 
making collective experiences that are not uh, mm, exclusive for black box theater. So you can have it on other fields. And sometimes it doesn't have to be masses. It could be something that is very intimate. And uh, I think, um, I see how many contemporary artists uh, right now work in a field that is in the same time a performance and at the same time it's an exhibition. Uh, it, it's create, it creates uh, environments that invites you to enter uh, and everything is starting to talk to you, not only the actor, also the objects, also the light, everything is uh, in a way, like in an animistic world, everything has in a way its own spirit that is starting to talk to you. And I think um, it doesn't have to be this kind of metaverse uh, fantasy. Uh, it's more interesting to me if it's based in the world, in the real world environment, with real bodies, with um, with a clear understanding of uh, the presence of uh, the other, that, as the other, and not uh, uh, as a kind of simulation of something. Uh, yeah. That is the other. Yeah. Yeah, and I think uh, uh, perhaps uh, one marker of that new theater also is that audiences are in the idea of this French great philosopher Roncia, an emancipated spectator, um, that they are um, part of something. They are invited as participants also, and not just as, a, you know, a, in politics, we say just the voter in the business, they're just the consumer in the theater world, we say they're just the audience know that there are new ways. We had Aaron Lanzman with us just last week, who talked about his uh, project that goes on for many years now, where he reenacts with people from the audience city council meetings and asks people to re say the words that are the, 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 the foundational elements of democracy when people talk to each other in city council meetings and decide the fate of a city. Or Michael Klein, who we had two weeks ago in a social choreography where he asked dancers, but also not audiences, to be in a room for three, four hours on the floor and follow each other's movements and spend time and think about work. So they are, um, I think, um, many, uh, many uh, uh, ways. But um, yeah. I think, yeah, go ahead. It's, it's, um, it's, it's more than this kind of question of uh, participation. I think uh, it's very important um, uh, and you, you, you should feel yourself invited. Uh, it becomes for younger generation, a quite of a kind of uh, obscure uh, the <laughs> this kind of hierarchic uh, relation between stage and audience and so it becomes in a way old fashioned in a, in a interconnected world uh, but in a, in a way it, it becomes also maybe interesting because it's so different but uh, i think it's not about the participation between humans the, the more uh, radical question is how can we um, make the weather be part of the show? How can we make the daylight a part of the show? How, how can we invite noises, uh, uh, plants, the presence of so many other things that are all the time around us? And maybe we have to, to open the black box for that, but it could be also like in the Philip Pareno uh, organism of artworks. It could be also done by technology and uh, by sensors or whatever but we should not um, look only on ourselves how we can invite the audience we should invite uh, the sky and uh, we should invite uh, ghosts and whatever yeah, yeah absolutely and that is so right and i think that is the real uh, radical uh, message to pay attention to it in our daily lives but also on the stage and in art because it is uh, and i think uh, the, the the question now how do we make something meaningful, something that also represents the urgency um, of how different uh, we have to uh, understand life and what a lot of scientists and artists already have understood, how do we uh, practice it? And um, I do believe in the um, significance of that 
symbolic, uh, imaginary, but real space um, of theater. And we have to be very careful what we show and the idea that it's just a product that we just entertain um, that perhaps ultimately supports um, systems that do not uh, that uh, do not work. I mean, some uh, radical people say, you know, therapy and all these things, you know, they just teach people how to cope with things instead of asking them to change or looking at a system that produces things that do no longer, system that do not work. And we have to say that. And um, last night was a big television night in the US and that's TV series Succession, the old Titanic, uh, Lo uh, Logan Roy uh, died, uh, some capitalist, the, a hyper or capitalist and the, his children who have no children and they are um, lost. Uh, they are, you don't see animals, you don't see plants. And the big question is, how do you go forward? What have they inherited? There is this wealth, but it has destroyed so much. And, um, and the question is also, how does theater um, uh, react um, to that? And I think you um, and your, 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 your circle, artists and friends who you represent as you Julia Strauss, who you mentioned, Bruno Latour, Friederik, who will uh, talk to us, Andreas Weber, um, in that idea of a big organism that is thinking, that is rethinking things. I think it's something we really have to pay attention to. Bonnie Oranka wrote of, also about the theater of ecology. Richard Schachner of this ecological theater, as you said, Umas, and so many think about it, but perhaps it's really time to um, ask us who produce art or present art what is the most important thing we have to do? What can we, how can we contribute to help us realize what already has changed? And you said that we're not talking about some idea or some theoretical academic reflection. The world we live in has radically changed, but we are blind to it. We don't see it. And just to say we avoid our carbon footprint, I don't take this flight and I make a contribution. It is, not, it is not enough and an artistic engagement where also I think emotions and feelings do come in um, is, um, is called for and we have to find and research uh, what works, what makes an effect. And um, also we do know by observing, by a practice of how the universe changes, experiments and labs show us, you know, that in, in quantum physics that just by the way to think about, reflect about it, change is taking place and I, hope and think that our work here in that little tiny skill at the Siegel Center, but also your brilliant work with the, uh, at the time with the Festspiele and your new uh, uh, projects about writing, um, you know, um, will help us to understand better where we are and preserve something that has been lost to reinterpret the old with new technologies. And Roncier always said, when old traditions come to new technology, something important and significant happens in the art. So what are you working on at the moment? Tell us a little bit about the projects. I know you do so much. Uh, what uh, exhibitions, projects, houses, books, uh, theater plays? Mm -hmm. What are you? What's on your mind? Uh, in ten days, we will open a great uh, exhibition in the National Gallery of Pristina uh, by uh, Albanian artist um, uh, Carlo is his name, um, and uh, I think. Um, it's for me a very, very important uh, experience of, of Eastern Europe, part of Europe that is not part of the European Union, of uh, people who all experienced war, who all experienced uh, colonization in a way, and that is a deep uh, and very uh, intense uh, uh, experience I make right now. And then I'm uh, writing about language, uh, a book about language, um, because I think we, uh, it's one of the things I'm, I'm interested in it because we can't avoid after we are two years old, we are entering a system that is for lifetime uh, determinative for, for our way how we behave how we think how we think what we are and um what influence uh what influences has new words has new ideas um how do they change our mind but um uh, how do we change the world by using a kind of new language this is something that i'm i feel very close right now you are and, a collector uh, of words right you collect new words and uh 
published them. Yes, so, yeah, since many years, yeah. Yeah, and um, and I'm, I have a good friend in uh, in Athens and try to organize something there. And I'm working for a very inspiring man, He's a great visioner, entrepreneur. Yeah, a lot of things. A lot of things, yeah. So stay in contact with us and let's see if we can pull off something in the New York City parks for the fall that is maybe a little... Um, Great that, idea. Yeah, uh, connect us to idea. that. And, um, and, um, and so we are in dialogue. Perhaps we are a little bit, at least us uh, at the Siegel or the Academia or the theater here, a little bit behind um, of that significant uh, discussion. America has such an abundance of energy and uh, there's so much space. It's not uh, as visible as it should be and how uh, significant the crisis truly is and um, and many argue the point uh, of return um, has already been crossed and we will be see how we how to live now with what mankind um, has done and um, and we need and I think it is really true theater performance has to reflect it it has to be engaged it has to represent it and it has to call us for action and to be part of the change we want to see so this is a very important uh, a reminder um, we hope you, to read your book soon. You, do you know a title or uh, is that? Uh, no, um, which one? Your new one uh, you're working on. Um, uh, this is the Gaia Theater book. It's called so, the Gaia Theater. Yeah. Yeah, Gaia Theater. And the other book is called Five Years. But it's, a, it's, a, it's another story. It's because it's the collection of words for five years and all of our crises and inventions are collected in this in this book. But uh, I will to I will mention that I got an email today by Nancy Cohen, and she is doing on uh, Instagram and Tik no yes Instagram and TikTok uh, a very nice account. Uh, it's called Climate Change Theater, and uh, I, I don't know her, but uh, I did have a quick look on what they do, and uh, it seems to be funny. Uh, but in the same time, serious regarding our topic, uh, uh, changing, uh, change, changing in the crisis uh, of climate, and uh, try to be uh, more aware of our connections to to so many life forms that are non-human. <laughs> Fantastic. So thank you, Thomas, and to our listeners, thank you for taking time out. Uh, when we started the Siegel Talks, of course, there were in Corinth very few talks. Now there are so many digitally online, but I, we still believe uh, they are go across uh, time zones, across uh, nations, and they are uh, of significance. Join us uh, with Frederic Aitui on, on Friday. On Monday, we have um, um, Avra uh, with us, uh, uh, who created a book. It's thinking about what is a tragedy in a 21st century? What is it? How do you represent it? What is the idea of a tragedy and how can we, and how should it be shown? And she created the book with 30 participants um, about it. And then also Andreas Weber, um, a philosopher who will talk about his understanding of earth and art and life and how it is um, in a way all connected. So thank you, Thomas. Also, uh, thank you for giving us the title of the whole Earth Talks uh, uh, inspired. Mm -hmm. uh, by by earlier works also were there so and thank you for being such a good friend to our center and um and this important work what you are doing and i hope we will all stay in, in close contact bye bye to our listeners thanks to howlround sia and vj and uh, talia um, rosenthal with us here um, in new york and i hope to hear and see you all soon thank you yeah thomas thank you Thank you for your work, your important work, and thank you to the whole team. I think it's uh, something very urgent you do, and grateful for that. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Bye-bye. <laughs> thank you. Bye-bye.